this defense, gentlemen, they have got no defense. They never have come into close contact in this case, except on the proposition of abuse and vilification. They circle and flutter, but never light. They grab at varnish and cat's blood and rat's blood and Duffy's blood, but they never knuckle down and show this jury that it wasn't blood. And in view of the statement of that boy, Mel Stanford, who swept that floor Friday afternoon, in view of the statement of Mrs. Jefferson, in view of the statement of Christopher Columbus Barrett, who tells the truth, notwithstanding the fact that he gets his daily bread out of the coffers of the National Pencil Company, you know that that was the blood of this innocent victim of Frank's lustful passion. The defense is uncertain and indistinct on another proposition. They flutter and flurry, but never light when it comes to showing you what hole Jim Conley pushed his victim down. Did he shoot her back of that staircase back there? No. Why? Because the dust was thick over it. Because unimpeached witnesses have shown you it was nailed down. Because if he had shot her down that hole, the boxes piled up there to the ceiling would have as effectively concealed her body as if she had been buried in the grave. For some days or weeks. Did he shoot her down this other hole in the Clark Woodenware Company's place of business? Where even if what Schiff says is true, that they kept the shellac there, it would nevertheless have concealed her body a longer time than to put it down there by the dustbin, where the firemen and people were coming in through the back door. Did this Negro, who they say robbed this girl, even if he had taken the time to write the notes, which, of course, he didn't, even after he had knocked her in the head with that bludgeon, which they tell you had blood on it, and robbed her, even if he had been such a fool, and so unlike the other members of his race, by whom brutal murders have been committed, should have taken time to have tied a cord around her neck, a cord seldom found down there in the basement, according to your own statement, except when it's swept down in the trash, but a cord that hangs right up there on the office floor both back there in the varnish room and up there in the front. If he had done all that, a thing you know that he didn't do, after he had shot her down in that hole in the Clark Woodenware Company, down there in that wing of the place where they keep the shellac, if they do keep it, why would that Negro have gone down there and moved her body when she was more securely fixed down there? And why was it, will you tell me, if he shot her down that scuttle hole, that he wrote the notes and fixed the cord? And will you tell me how it happens that, when after this man Holloway, on May 1st, had grabbed old Jim Conley, when he saw him washing his shirt and said, he's my nigger. Fifteen days afterwards, when squad number two of the Pinkerton people had been searching through that factory a whole day and right down in that area, the elevator being run, the detectives, both the Pinkertons and the city force, had looked around there immediately after the crime. Will you tell me how it happened that, if he shot her down that hole, that there was so much blood not found until the 15th of May, and more blood than that poor girl was ever shown to have lost? Another thing. This man Frank says that, Mr. Quinn said he would like to take me back to the metal department on the office floor, where the newspapers that morning stated that Mr. Barrett of the metal department had claimed he had found blood spots and where he had found some hair. Although he had seen, in the morning papers, that this man Barrett claimed to have seen blood there, before he went back to see it, although this thing tore him all to pieces, and although he was anxious to employ a detective, so anxious that he phoned Schiff three times to get the Pinkertons down. According to his own statement, Lemmy Quinn had to come and ask him to see the blood spots on the second floor, found by this man, Barrett. Is that the conduct of a man, the head of a pencil factory, who had employed detectives, anxious to assist the police, saw it in the newspapers, and yet Lemmy Quinn had to go and ask him to go back? And then he tells you in this statement which is easy to write, was glibly rattled off, a statement that you might expect from a man that could plot the downfall of a girl of such tender years as little Mary Fagan, 
that he went back there and examined those blood spots with an electric flashlight, that he made a particular and a minute examination of them. But strange to say, not even Lemmy Quinn comes in to sustain you. And no man on earth, so far as this jury knows, ever saw Leo M. Frank examining what Barrett said, and Jefferson said, and Mel Stanford said, and Beaver said, and Storn said, and a host of others said was blood near the dressing room on the second floor. You know why? Because it never happened. If there was a spot on this earth that this man Frank didn't want to examine, if there was a spot on earth that he didn't want any blood found at all, it was on the second floor, the floor which, according to his own statement, he was working on when this poor girl met her death. Schiff, he says, saw those notes down there and at police headquarters. Frank says he visited the morgue not only once, but twice. If he went down there and visited that morgue and saw that child and identified her body and it tore him all to pieces, as he tells you it did, let any honest man, I don't care who he be, on this jury, seeking to fathom the mystery of this thing, tell me why it was, except for the answer that I give you, he went down there to view that body again? Rogers said he didn't look at it. Black said he didn't see him look at it. Mr. Rosser. He is misstating the evidence. Rogers never said that he didn't look at the body. He said he was behind him and didn't know whether he did or not. And Black said he didn't know whether he did or not. Mr. Dorsey. Rogers said he never did look at that body. Mr. Arnold. I insist that isn't the evidence. Rogers said he didn't know and couldn't answer whether he saw it or not, and Black said the same thing. Mr. Dorsey. I'm not going to quibble with you. The truth is, and you know it, that when that man Frank went down there to look at that body of that poor girl to identify her, he never went in that room. And if he did look at her long enough to identify her, neither John Black nor Rogers nor Giesling knew it. I tell you, gentlemen of the jury, that the truth of this thing is that Frank never looked at the body of that poor girl. But if he did, it was just a glance. As the electric light was flashed on, and he immediately turned and went into another room. Mr. Rosser. There isn't a bit of proof that he went into another room. I object again, sir. There isn't a particle of proof of that. Mr. Dorsey. If that man, Frank, ever looked at that girl's face, I challenge them to produce the record to show it. It was so brief that if she was dirty and begrimed and her hair was bloody and her features contorted, I tell you that if he didn't know her any better than he would have you believe he knew her, he never could have identified her as Mary Fagan. Never could. And I say to you, gentlemen of the jury, that the reason why this man revisited that morgue on Sunday afternoon after he had failed to mention the subject of death in the bosom of his family at the dining table, when he tells you that it tore him all to pieces, there was but one reason for revisiting that morgue, and that was to put his ear to the ground and see if, at that hour, there was any whisper or suggestion that Leo M. Frank, the guilty man, had committed the dastardly deed. Black didn't see him. Rogers didn't see him. Giesling didn't see him. One of the earliest to arrive, the superintendent of the factory. Rogers said he had his eye on him. He turned and stepped aside, and he himself said that the sight tore him all to pieces. And he seeks to have you believe that that automobile ride and the sight of that poor girl's features accounts for the nervousness which he displayed. And yet we find him going, like a dog to his vomit, a sow to her wallow, back to view the remains of this poor little innocent girl. And I ask you, gentlemen of the jury, if you don't know that the reason Leo M. Frank went down to that morgue on Sunday afternoon was to see if he could scent anything in the atmosphere indicating that the police suspected Leo M. Frank? He admits his nervousness. He admits his nervousness in the presence of the officers. The Selig's say that he wasn't nervous, that he wasn't nervous Saturday night when he telephoned Newt Lee to find out if anything had happened at the factory, that he wasn't nervous when he read this Saturday evening post. 
He wanted to get out of the view of any man who represented the majesty and dignity of the law. And he went in behind curtains, or any old thing that would hide his countenance from those men. I come back to the proposition in the bosom of his family. Notwithstanding, he read that Saturday evening post out there in the hall Saturday night. This thing kept welling in his breast to such an extent that he had to make a play of being composed and cool. And he went in there and tried to break up the card game with the laughter that was the laughter of a guilty conscience. Notwithstanding the fact that he was able, Sunday, at the dining table, and in the bosom of his family, when he hadn't discussed this murder, when Mrs. Selig didn't know that it was a murder that concerned her, when the whole Selig household were treating it as a matter of absolute indifference. If he wasn't nervous there, gentlemen of the jury, surely he was, as I am going to show you, nervous when he came face to face and had to discuss the proposition with the minions of the law. He was nervous when he went to run the elevator, when he went to the box to turn on the power. And he says here in his statement, unsupported by any oath, that he left that box open because some member of the fire department had come around and stated that you must leave that box open because the electricity might innocently electrocute some members of the fire department in case of fire. I ask you, gentlemen of the jury, what was the necessity for leaving the box open when a simple turn of the lever would have shut off the electricity and enabled the key to have been hung up in the office, just exactly like old Holloway swore when he didn't know the importance of the proposition, in the affidavit which I have and which was submitted in evidence to you, that that box was locked and the key was put in Frank's office? Why don't they bring the firemen here who went around and gave such instructions? First, because it wasn't necessary they could have cut the electricity off and locked the box. And second, they didn't bring him because no such man ever did any such thing. And old Holloway told the truth before he came to the conclusion that old Jim Conley was his nigger. And he saw the importance of the proposition, that when Frank went there Sunday morning, the box was unlocked and Frank had the key in his pocket. Mr. Rosser You say Mr. Frank had the key in his pocket? No one mentioned it. That isn't the evidence. I say it was hung up in the office. That's the undisputed evidence. Mr. Dorsey. Holloway says when he got back Monday morning, it was hung up in the office. But Boots Rogers said this man, Frank, and he was sustained by other witnesses, when he came there to run that elevator Sunday morning, found that power box unlocked. Mr. Rosser. That's not what you said. Mr. Dorsey. Yes, it is. Mr. Rosser. You said Frank had the key in his pocket next morning, and that isn't the evidence. There's not a line to that effect. The court. Do you still insist that he had it in his pocket? Mr. Dorsey. I don't care anything about that. The point of the proposition, the gist of the proposition, the force of the proposition is that old Holloway stated, way back yonder in May, when I interviewed him, that the key was always in Frank's office. This man told you that the power box and the elevator was unlocked Sunday morning, and the elevator started without anybody going and getting the key. Mr. Rosser. That's not the point he was making. The point he was making to show how clearly Frank must have been connected with it. He had the key in his pocket. He was willing to say that when he ought to know that's not so. The court. He's drawing a deduction that he claims he's drawing. Mr. Rosser. He doesn't claim that. He says the point is it was easily gotten in the office, but that's not what he said. The court. You claim that's a deduction you are drawing? Mr. Dorsey. Why, sure. The court. Now, you don't claim the evidence shows that. Mr. Dorsey. I claim that the power box was standing open Sunday morning. The court. Do you insist that the evidence shows he had it in his pocket? Mr. Dorsey. I say that's my recollection, but I'm willing to waive it. But let them go to the record, and the record will sustain me on that point. 
just like it sustains me on the evidence of this man Rogers, which I'm now going to read. Rogers said, Mr. Giesling caught the face of the dead girl and turned it over towards me. I looked then to see if anybody followed me, and I saw Mr. Frank step from outside of the door into what I thought was a closet, but I afterwards found out where Mr. Giesling slept, or somebody slept. There was a little single bed in there. I don't want to misrepresent this testimony. For goodness knows there's enough here without resorting to any such practice as that. And I don't want to mislead this jury, and furthermore, I'm not going to do it. Frank says, after looking at the body, I identify that little girl as the one that had been up shortly after the noon of the day previous and got her money from me. I then unlocked the safe and took out the payroll book and found that it was true that a little girl by the name of Mary Fagan did work in the metal plant and that she was due to draw $1.20. The payroll book showed that, and as the detective had told me that someone had identified the body of that little girl as that of Mary Fagan, there could be no question but that it was one and the same girl. And he might have added, As I followed her back into the metal department and proposed to her that she submit to my lascivious demands, I hit her. She fell. She struck her head. To protect my character, I choked her. To protect my reputation, I choked her. And called Jim Conley to move her down to the basement. And for all these reasons, because I made out the payroll for 52 weeks during which time Mary had worked there, I know, for these reasons, although I didn't look at her and couldn't have recognized her if she was in the dirty, distorted condition. He tells you, in this statement, she really was. But I know it was Mary Fagan. And he corroborates in his statement to these detectives. He says down at the undertaking establishment, went down a long, dark passageway with Mr. Rogers following. Then I came and Black brought up the rear. Giesling was on the opposite side of the little cooling table, the table between him and me. He took the head in his hands, put his finger exactly where the wound in the left side back of the head was located, and he seeks to have you believe that he... Notice the hands and arms of the little girl were very dirty, blue and ground with dirt and cinders, nostrils and mouth. The mouth being open, nostrils and mouth just full of sawdust, the face was all puffed out, the right eye was blackened and swollen, and there was a deep scratch over the left eye on the forehead. He tells in his statement that in that brief glance, if he ever took any glance at all, he saw that the only way in the world to believe him is to say that these men, John Black and Boots Rogers, who have got no interest in this case in God's world but to tell the truth, perjured themselves to put the rope around the neck of this man. Do you believe it? Starnes is a perjurer, too. Starnes says, When I called this man up over the telephone, I was careful not to mention what had happened. And unless Starnes on that Sunday morning in April was very different from what you would judge him to be by his deportment on the stand here the other day, he did exactly what he said he did. And yet this defendant in his statement said he says, What's the trouble? Has there been a fire? He says, no, a tragedy. I want you to come down right away. I says, all right. I'll send the automobile after you. And Starn says that he never mentioned the word tragedy. And yet, so conscious, so conscious was this man Frank, when Rogers and Black went out there, and he, nervously twitching at his collar, asked, What's the trouble? Has the night watchman reported anything? And asked them not, has there been a fire? But has there been a tragedy? But Starnes, the man who first went after Newt Lee, the Negro night watchman, because he pointed his finger of suspicion at him, Starnes, the man who went after Gant, because this defendant pointed the finger of suspicion at him. Starnes, the man who has been a detective here on the police force for years and years, is a perjurer and a liar. To do what? Simply to gratify his ambition and place a noose around the neck of this man Frank, when he could have gone out after, 
if the circumstances had warranted it, or if he had been a rascal and wanted to travel along the line of least resistance, neutrally, or Gant, or Conley. Another thing. Old Newt Lee says that when this defendant called him Saturday night, a thing that he had never done during the time that he had been there at that pencil factory, serving him as night watchman, Newt Lee tells you, although the defendant says that he asked about Gant, Newt Lee says that Gant's name was never mentioned, and that the inquiry was, Has anything happened at the factory? You tell me, gentlemen of the jury, that all these circumstances— with all these incriminating circumstances piling up against this man, that we have nothing in this case but prejudice and perjury? Newt says he never mentioned Gant. Frank, in his statement, says, I succeeded in getting Newt Lee and asked him if Mr. Gant had gone. He instructed this man, Newt Lee, to go with Gant, to watch him, to stay with him, and old Newt Lee wouldn't even let Gant in that factory unless Frank said that he might go up. He had instructed Lee previous thereto not to let him in for the simple reason he didn't want Gant coming down there. Why? Because he didn't want him to come down and see and talk with little Mary, for some reason I know not why. And old Newt Lee stopped this man Gant on the threshold and refused to let him go up. And this man Frank says, you go up with him and see that he gets what he wants and usher him out. And yet, though he had never done any such thing during the time Newt Lee had been up there, he innocently called Newt up to find out, he said, if Gant had gone, and Newt said to find out if everything was all right at the factory. And you know that the reason he called up was to find out if Newt, in making his rounds, had discovered the body of this dead girl. Would you convict him on this circumstance or that circumstance? No. But I would weave them all together, and I would make a rope, no one strand of which sufficiently strong to send this man to the gallows for this poor girl's death, but I would take them all together, and I would say, in conformity with the truth and right, they all make such a rope and such a strand and such a cable that it's impossible not only to conceive a reasonable doubt, but to conceive any doubt at all. Frank was in jail. Frank had already stated in his affidavit at police headquarters, which is in evidence, contradicting this statement and this chart which they have made, that he didn't leave his office between certain hours. Frank didn't know that his own detective, Harry Scott, had found this little Montine Stover. And I quote her evidence, I quote it, and I submit it shows that she went in that office and went far enough in that office to see who was in there. And if she didn't go far enough in, it's passing strange that anybody in that office, Frank himself, could have heard that girl and could have made his presence known. Scott, their own Pinkerton detective, gets the statement from Montine Stover, and he visits Leo M. Frank in his cell at the jail. Frank, in order to evade that, says... To the best of my recollection, I didn't stir out of the office, but it's possible that, in order to answer a call of nature, I may have gone to the toilet. These are things that a man does unconsciously, and can't tell how many times nor when he does it. I tell you, gentlemen of the jury, that if this man Frank had remained in his office, and was in his office when Montine Stover went in there, he would have heard her, he would have seen her, he would have talked with her. He would have given her her pay. I tell you, gentlemen of the jury, that if this man Frank had stepped out of his office to answer a call of nature, that he would have remembered it. And if he wouldn't have remembered it, at least he wouldn't have stated so repeatedly and unqualifiedly that he never left his office. And only on the stand here, when he faces an honest jury, charged with the murder, and circumstances banked up against him, does he offer the flimsy excuse that these are things that people do unconsciously and without any recollection? But this man Scott, in company with Black, after they found that little Montine Stover had been there at exactly the time that old Jim Conley says that that man with this poor little unfortunate girl had gone to the rear, and on May 3rd, 
the very time that Montine Stover told them that she had been up there. At that time, this Pinkerton detective, Scott, as honest and honorable a man has ever lived, the man who said he was going hand in hand with the police department of the city of Atlanta, and who did, notwithstanding the fact that some of the others undertook to leap with the hare and run with the hounds, stood straight up by the city detectives and by the state officials and by the truth. Put these questions on May 3rd to Leo M. Frank. Says he to Frank. From the time you got to the factory from Montauk Brothers until you went to the fourth floor to see White and Denham, were you inside your office the entire time? Answer. I was. Again, says Scott, and Mr. Scott, in jail, when Frank didn't know the importance of the proposition, because he didn't know that little Montine Stover had said that she went up there and saw nobody in his office. Scott came at him from another different angle. From the time you came from Montauk Brothers until Mary Fagan came, were you in your office? And Frank said, Yes. From 12 o'clock, says Scott, until Mary Fagan entered your office, and thereafter until 12.50, when you went upstairs to get Mrs. White out of the building, were you in your office? Answer. Yes. Then, says Scott, from 12 to 12.30, every minute during that half hour, you were in your office? And Frank said, yes. And not until he saw the wonderful capacity, the wonderful ability, the wonderful devotion of this man Scott to the truth and right, did he ever shut him out from his counsel. No suggestion, then, that he might have had to answer a call of nature, but emphatically. Without knowing the importance, he told his own detective, in the presence of John Black, that at no time, for no purpose, from a few minutes before this unfortunate girl arrived until he went upstairs at 12.50 to ask Mrs. White to leave, had he been out of his office. Then you tell me that an honest jury, with no motive but to do right, would accept the statement of this man Frank, that he might have been, these things occur so frequently that a man can't remember, and by that statement set aside what he said to his own detective, Harry Scott, well, you can do it. You have got the power to do it. No king on the throne, no potentate has the power that is vested in the American jury. In the secret of your consultation room, you can write a verdict that outrages truth and justice, if you want to, and no power on earth can call you to account. But your conscience. But so long as you live, wherever you go, that conscience has got to be with you. You can't get away from it. And if you do it, you will lose the peace of mind that goes with a clear conscience of duty done. And never again, so long as you shall last upon this earth, though others not knowing the truth might respect you, will you ever have your own self-esteem. I have already talked to you about this time element. You made a mighty effort to break down little George Epps. You showed that McCoy didn't have a watch have tried to show this man Kenley was a liar because he knew the little girl and felt that he knew in his heart who the murderer was. But there's one witness for the state against whom not a breath of suspicion has been apparent. We impeached these men, Matthews and Hollis, by other witnesses besides George Epps and besides George Kenley and besides McCoy. And as to how that little girl got to that factory, gentlemen, this man, Mr. Kelly, who rode on the same car with Hollis, the same car that Hollis claims or Matthews claims that he rode on, knew the girl, knew Matthews, tells you and he's unimpeached and unimpeachable. And there's no suggestion here, even if you set the evidence of Epps and McCoy and Kenley aside, upon which an honest jury can predicate a doubt that this man Kelly of the streetcar company didn't tell the truth when he says that she wasn't on that car, that this man Matthews says she was, and she went around, because... I rode with Matthews, and I know her, and I know Matthews. 
And Mr. Rosser says that he don't care anything about all this medical evidence. He don't care anything about cabbage. I'm not going back on my raising here or anywhere. And I tell you, gentlemen, that there is no better, no more wholesome meal. And when the stomach is normal and all right, there is nothing that is more easily digested. Because the majority of the substances which you eat takes the same length of time that cabbage requires. And I tell you that cabbage, cornbread, and buttermilk is good enough for any man. I tell you, gentlemen of the jury, that Mr. Rosser's statement here, that he don't care anything for that evidence of Dr. Roy Harris about this cabbage, which was taken out of that poor girl's stomach, is not borne out by the record in this case. It wouldn't surprise me if these able, astute gentlemen, vigilant as they have shown themselves to be, didn't go out and get some doctors who have been the family physicians and who are well known to some of the members of this jury for the effect that it might have upon you. Mr. Arnold. There is not a word of evidence as to that. It is a grossly improper argument, and I move that that be withdrawn from the jury. Mr. Dorsey. I don't state it as a fact, but I am suggesting it. Mr. Arnold. He has no right to deduct it or suggest it. I just want your honor to reprove it. Reprimand him and withdraw it from the jury. I just make the motion, and your honor can do as you please. Mr. Dorsey. I am going to show that there must have been something besides the training of these men, and I'm going to contrast them with our doctors. Mr. Arnold. I move to exclude that as grossly improper. He says he is arguing that some physician was brought here because he was the physician of some member of the jury. It's grossly unfair, and it's grossly improper and insulting, even to the jury. Mr. Dorsey. I say it is eminently proper and absolutely a legitimate argument. Mr. Arnold. I just record my objection, and if your honor lets it stay in, you can do it. Mr. Dorsey. Yes, sir. That wouldn't scare me, your honor. The court. Well, I want to try it right, and I suppose you do. Is there anything to authorize that inference to be drawn? Mr. Dorsey. Why, sure. The fact that you went out and got general practitioners that know nothing about the analysis of the stomach, know nothing about pathology. The court. Go on, then. Mr. Dorsey. I thought so. Mr. Arnold. Does your honor hold that as proper? I thought so. The court. I hold that he can draw any inference legitimately from the testimony and argue it. I do not know whether or not there is anything to indicate that any of these physicians was the physician of the family. Mr. Rosser. Let me make the suggestion. Your honor ought to know that before you let him testify it. The court. He says he does not know it. He's merely arguing it from an inference he has drawn. Mr. Dorsey. I can't see any other reason in God's world for going out and getting these practitioners who have never had any special training on stomach analysis and who have not had any training with the analysis of tissues like a pathologist has had, except upon that theory. And I am saying to you, gentlemen of the jury, that the number of doctors that these men put up here belie the statement of Mr. Rosser, that he doesn't attach any importance to this cabbage proposition, because they knew, as you know, that it is a powerful factor in sustaining the state's case and breaking down the alibi of this defendant. It fastens and fixes and nails down with the accuracy only which a scientific fact can do. That this little girl met her death between the time she entered the office of the superintendent and the time Mrs. White came up the stairs at 1235 to see her husband and found this defendant at the safe and saw him jump. You tell me that this Dr. Childs, this general practitioner, who don't know anything about the action of the gastric juices on foods in the stomach, this man of the short experience of seven years, this gentleman, 
splendid gentleman though he is, from Michigan, can put his opinion against the eminent secretary of the Georgia Board of Health, Dr. Roy Harris? I tell you no. Now, briefly, let's run over this nervousness proposition. The man indicated nervousness when he talked to old man John Starnes, when Black went out to his house and he sent his wife down to give him nerve. Although he was nearly dressed and she wasn't at all dressed, he betrayed his nervousness by the rapidity of his questions, by the form of his questions. But first, before we get to that, he warned old Newt Lee to come back there Saturday at four o'clock. And dutiful old darky that he was, old Newt walked in, and Frank then was engaged in washing his hands. Jim Conley hadn't come, but he was looking for Conley, and he sent old Newt Lee out, although Newt insisted that he wanted to sleep. And although he might have found a cozy corner on any floor in that factory, with plenty of sacks and cords and other things to make him a pallet, he wanted old man Newt to leave. Why? When Newt said he was sleepy, he wanted him to leave so that he could do just exactly what old Jim Conley told you Frank made his promise to do. He wanted an opportunity to burn that body so that the city police of Atlanta wouldn't have the Fagan mystery solved today. And probably it would not even be known that the girl lost her life in that factory. His anxiety about Gant going back into that building that afternoon, when he hung his head and said to Gant that he saw a boy sweeping out a pair of shoes, and Gant says, What were they? Tan or black? And ah, gentlemen, it looked like Providence had foreordained that this did. Long legged Gant should leave. Not only one pair, but two pairs. What kind were they? He said. He gave him the name of one color, and then, as Providence would have it, old Gant said, Ah, but I've got two pair. And then it was that he dared not say, because he couldn't then say, that he saw that man also sweeping them out. Then it was that he said, All right, Newt, go up with him and let him get them. And lo and behold, the shoes that this man Frank would have him believe were swept out, both tan and black, were there. Gant tells you how he acted. Newt tells you how he jumped. You've been listening to our continuing audiobook series featuring the best writing from the American Mercury on the Leo Frank case. Be with us next time when we'll continue with the next installment of the American Mercury on Leo Frank.